So here's the, the hard scripture reading I was talking about before our prayer confession. It's John 6, 56 through 69. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Our ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he has been before, he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and, and to know that you are the Holy One of God. God. God bless his word. Let's pray. Gracious God, may the ears that hear this know that it is you that chooses us not we who choose you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is, as Dawn said, one of the most challenging passages to preach on because of its tie to the Bread of Life discourse, which starts with the feeding of the 5,000, but it links to broader themes found elsewhere in the Gospel. Themes like the nature of belief, the spirit of eternal life, the relationship between the father and the son, as well as Judas's role as betrayer, just to name a few. It's important to realize that for the last three weeks, we have been building up to this point in John chapter 6. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on this text because when we start at verse 56, it's rather confusing. So Jesus is answering a question that the Jews had asked, and that question being, how can this man give, his give, his, give us his flesh to eat? And when that sentence refers to the Jews that asked the question, I believe it's just not general Jewish population. Rather, it's the Jewish leaders, since the exchange takes place in the synagogue. Now we know that Jesus is using metaphorical language here. However, anyone unaccustomed to John's style of writing could be easily offended and misunderstand this and other passages. And here are just two examples earlier in John's gospel that were misunderstood. The first occurred in chapter 3 where Nicodemus could not fathom how a person could be born again. And then again in chapter 4, where the Samaritan woman does not grasp the concept of living water gushing forth. And again, he uses in 56, Jesus uses this metaphorical language when he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. And then Jesus sort of doubled downs on his statement by saying in verse 57, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. 
It is possible that Jesus doubles down by repeating the eating of the flesh and the drinking of the blood to get his audience to think and reconsider, to reflect on his words and look back, but also look past the superficial meaning and to see and to find and to understand the super realm, the supernatural realm of what's happening here. Something far beyond the material and the natural world. But all they, the Jews, can hear, the religious leaders, can hear and comprehend at that moment is the violation of the dietary laws that they believe Jesus is suggesting to them that they break, which he's not. But rather than ease his adversary's anguishes, Jesus' next statement further intensifies it when he declares, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus' remark would have been especially confusing and disturbing for them if he had pointed to his own body, which I believe he probably did. The bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh, he said. Unfortunately, the narrative does not provide any clues about Jesus' gesture, so, which leaves us to interpret it as a guess about such things. But it is at this point in the conversation that John turns our, our attention and his attention not only to the disciples' reaction, but also to those standing around. Again, the religious leaders, because in verse 60, it says, along with the Jews and the disciples, they were all complaining. They, meaning both the disciples and the religious authorities, but they find this teaching and Pardon the pun, they find this teaching hard to swallow. And that sediment is reiterated in verse 60, where we are told that the crowd, as well as his disciples, were joining in the murmuring, saying out loud that this is a hard teaching. And when you look up that word in the Greek, hard teaching, the word literally means offensive. So it's not really a hard, it's just, it's something offensive to hear. It's hard to hear. It hurts to hear those words. In verse 61, we're, we're told, aware of this, the disciples were grumbling about this. And Jesus says to them, does this offend you? Something important that I think we need to notice here is I think it's important that we recognize the difference in this passage between the word believer and disciple. A disciple is a student or a pupil, and I believe the way that it's used here in this passage is that, just that. They're, they're a student or a disciple. I mean, a, a student or a pupil. That's just the point that was someone who was following Jesus, at least for a time, However, not all people that were following him were believers. We see this because this is the first hard statement that Jesus makes. And we see that it separates the believers from the non-believers. It separates those who were following him looking for physical nourishment rather than spiritual nourishment and enlightenment. It's important that we learn in this passage who's who. There are the ones who say that they don't like this and can no longer stay as followers of Jesus. So in the next few verses, Jesus asks them, if these small things bother you so bad, what are you going to think when you see miraculous things that come in the near future? In other words, he's saying, if you can't accept my word on small things, you're not going to accept me at all. At this point, my words that are causing you to stumble, it's not my words that are causing you to stumble. It's, it's not because you don't like to hear about flesh and, and blood that you become offended. He says, yes, that's, that's the topic that brought this to the service, but it's not the real problem. 
The problem that led them to grumble, and he repeats his statement again in verse 65, he says, it's because of what I've already said. Your problem is the same as the crowd said before. And then he repeats verse 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. And then it goes on, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. This is what he is saying. The one who gives us eternal life is the Spirit. He is referring to how we are born again. It is literally a process done by the Spirit of God inside of us and how we come to believe and come to be saved and come to receive eternal life. Then Jesus calls them out and says, some of you are unbelievers. He says, some of these people do not believe now. Some, we know, are true disciples who have followed Jesus, but some are not. Then John adds, Jesus knew from the beginning who these believers were. I always find it interesting how that short phrase, or there's short phrases in the Bible that catch our attention. And this is one of those. Jesus knew from the beginning. What do you think John means when he says from the beginning? Does he mean from the beginning of that day? From the beginning of the synagogue meeting? From the beginning of the events to the prior, from the prior day? No, he means from the beginning of the foundations of the earth. He means what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. He means from the very beginning, as Jesus recruited these men like he did all the disciples, he was recruiting some that he knew did not believe in him. And for that matter, would not ever believe in him. Some that were given to him by the Father, some that were not given to him by the Father, would come to Christ. And in fact, John adds, just to make sure that we're not in any doubt of this, that we're not misunderstanding his words, he says, Jesus even selected, he says, to, he says Jesus, Jesus even selected the disciple that he knew beforehand would be the one to one day betray him. See, God wasn't willing to leave to chance any aspect of our plan of salvation. For he even included the fact that there needed to be a, a betrayer assigned to that role. He wasn't waiting for each person to make up their own minds. Certainly his identity, he wasn't preaching every day to this crowd hoping for a convert or more disciples to believe in him. He didn't have some unrealistic expectation that if he just changed his message a little or softened it, it would become more appealing to the crowd and capture their attention, more of the audience. He knew who the Father had selected for him before he left heaven to come to earth. So when Jesus came to earth, when Jesus walked around Galilee and he ministered to the crowds, he could see a person and he knew whether it was a sheep or he was a goat or she was a goat. He knew who he was. He knew who the people were. He knew Nathaniel was one of his. And that's why he could say to Nathaniel, he saw him even before he approached Nathaniel. He knew exactly what, was, what he was going for and why the woman at the well was the person that was going to be one of his sheep. So he stopped and talked to her when he could have otherwise just walked right by her. He knew in the same way 
He knew who were not given to him by the Father. He knew who would never come to believe in him. And Jesus repeats again in verse 65, and I believe it's the central belief how no one came to believe in Jesus unless it had been granted by his Father. So in other words, if someone rejects Christ, it's simply an indication that that person has not been given that gift from our Father, from the Father. At least not on that day. Because we cannot look into the future and necessarily know the final result. We can only see what's happening today. So we see the truth of his words and the effect it had on the crowds. And as a result of many of these statements, some of the disciples were absolutely through with him. This was the final straw, so to speak, and they left him. And Jesus challenges the 12 here. He says, do you want to go away as well? And of course, it's Peter that speaks up. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? We, we go to you. To whom shall we go? No, Lord. This is the last sentence of my sermon. I don't want to screw it up, all right? <laughs> I know some of you are giving you, oh, finally. <laughs> Peter, who speaks up and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. But you know what Jesus does? He rebukes Peter. He rebukes Peter by saying, No, I chose you. And that is how it is all, that is how it is for every one of us. Jesus chooses us. The reason he chooses us is because he's the Holy One of God. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you choose us to be yours. And Lord, we, I pray that we accept that when you choose each one of us. It is in his name we pray. Amen.